feel the hands that you hold. That is the presence of the divine. No matter what that person looks like, where they come from, what they believe, what they think, we are one. And as we have created this human chain, let us recognize that this human chain is the metaphor, the epitome of that oneness made manifest right here in this room. We claim that oneness as the healing power in consciousness. We claim ourselves as being of beings of love and light, that we are that place in consciousness, that we stand utterly convinced that when we stand in this wholeness, when we know the truth of who we are, we know the truth of who each and every person is. And we grab each other's hands all around the Metroplex, all around the US, all around the world, for we are one. And if you, like me, agree with this statement, let us seal it with our love and faith, our trust and truth, by saying together, and so it is. Amen. I'm so glad you joined us today. That makes you a part of CSL Dallas, and we love that our community continues to grow. And we also love to give great spiritual content. And a way that you can participate in our community is financially give to it. It's easy to do so. Go to CSLDallas.org and hit the Give button. Or you can set up a text giving mechanism at 972-954-4404, a safe and secure way to send us money whenever you watch a great message like this. So thanks for giving and buckle up because here comes the spiritual content. Yeah, so, you know, that's what we're here to do, right? Is to support each other and flying to to be the best that we came here to be, to, to love as deeply as we know how to love, to live as full out as we know how to live, to grow, to, to stumble and fall, to um, be together in community um, in all of those ways, and to really, um, yeah, to really support each other uh, through thick and thin. And um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you start right here. Okay. Um. So the thick and thin that, we're, that we've been walking through for two years, right, has been um, part of what's been going on in our culture today. Um, the thick and thin that we've experienced. Um, and we have an election coming up in two days. Mm -hmm. So this isn't anything new, actually. If we think about it, for any of us that are adults, and we've been on this planet at least more than 18 years, right, um, we have an election coming up. And like with every election, some people are happy and some people aren't. Uh, the night of, the morning of, the day of the election. And um, so just like last time, we can imagine that come Tuesday night, some people are going to be happy and some people aren't going to be happy. And we have people within our lives that we're close to that... Um, we may not be on the same place in that moment. We may have immediate family members. Uh, we may have chosen family members. We may have the non-chosen family members. We may have our uh, people that we work with. We have people in this community that at any particular moment, at the results as they come in of this next election, will be happy and some will be upset. And so um, what's started to happen over these past years, and it's, it's, it's not been like immediate in the past two years, it's just been growing, it's been growing, it seems to be growing, this us and them. There's us, and then there's them. And what is growing in that is the blame. It's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault and fear. Um, I remember, and I probably know the age that I was, and this was over a decade ago, when there started to be this uh, message of fear. Be afraid, be afraid, be afraid. And this fear seems to be growing, this message of fear. 
Um, so what are we, what are each of us individually, and what are we as a community, how are we going to be, and what are we going to do after this election, regardless of the outcome? Because again, some people are going to be happy and some people are going to be upset. How can we contribute to not be that culture and be that part of that us and them? Are we going to contribute to the us and them or are we not going to contribute to the us and them culture? Are we going to contribute to the blame? Are we going to contribute to the fear? Are we going to contribute to the anger? Are we going to contribute to the resignation? Oh, goodness. You know, how are we going to be and do after this? Yeah, and so Karen and I have been having a lot of conversations about this, you know, and we've been having conversations for a number of years. What's ours to do in terms of um, being participating in consciousness? And how do we um, be in this place where we don't become polarized, we don't uh, continue the divisiveness, and we especially don't continue it here in our community, um, and that we heal it, that we become a place where we really see how we walk through this together. And, and it's been really interesting to have this conversation because we, you know, we kind of circled around, well, we have to be love. We have to, you know, we have to bring love into every situation. We have to be love. And, and, and I'm not always sure we know what that means. I think sometimes we say we have to be love um, as long as somebody agrees with us. Or we have to be love because we actually know what the form of that love looks like. And if you don't love the way that I love, you're wrong. And so in really exploring this, as we've been talking about the conversation for today, it's really the result we're trying to get to is that we actually show up in consciousness and as a centered spiritual being. That's really, that's really what um, we are called to do and to be. It's in, so it's not what we do. Should we be loving? Should we be for this or be against that or do this or do that? We're going to all do whatever it is that it calls to us from our heart and from our deepest understanding. What's important is how we do what we do. The way in which we approach and engage is really the cornerstone of what we teach in the science of mind. It is the development of consciousness that sees the oneness that we are and that knows the truth of our being so that we can be and do actually from a centered, grounded place. And, and, and to come from that centered, grounded place in, this, in these conversations that Petra and I have been having, um, one of my challenges, and, and it's truly one of my challenges, is to um, consider what are my inner thoughts and feelings in any given moment. And when I start to become aware and I become conscious of my inner thoughts and feelings, if, and there's only one or two times ever, but of course, yeah. Yes, if, dear. Yes. If my inner thoughts and feelings aren't in congruence and in alignment with how I want to be in the world, then what can happen for me, I don't know about y'all, but what happens for me is when I'm not in congruence on the inside of me, what I do is I project them out there. A lot of times right there. And then guess what? Um, because I project them out there and it's with people that I know and love deeply, then that, that makes it even more <laughs> when I'm aware that I'm not in congruence. I'm projecting even more because I'm not in congruence inside. And you see, it's this vicious swa, it's this vicious cycle that starts to happen for me. And so the thing that I am learning to do, I'm still learning is to take responsibility for it, right? That I have to take responsibility for the fact that I'm not in alignment on the inside of me with me. 
It has nothing to do with anybody out there. I'm just not in alignment with me. I'm not showing up the way I want to show up. And when am I congruent with myself and what I say? Am I congruent within myself with what I believe? Am I congruent inside myself with what I value? And to, to pay attention to all that. If my value is to be kind to those around me, and yet I'm not kind to myself within my own self, you see, then I start to project. And now I'm not kind again. And then it happens. And so I need to start paying attention. And what I've started to do is to start paying attention also to what am I taking in? What am I taking in? What am I watching? What am I letting in? And I love um, this image. I've loved this image of Mary Baker Eddy. It's a quote, and she says, to stand guard at the portals of our own mind. To stand guard at what comes in. To stand guard as to what we allow to come in and what we take in. And then to stand guard inside of our own selves. Ernest Holmes has a definition that... I am reminded of many times. The definition is for the word hell. And he defines hell as a discordant state of being. A belief in duality. A sense of separation from God. So when I feel separate from God, from spirit, I'm in hell. And he says it's a belief that our good is always to be and never is. So hell is not a location. It's a state of mind. And I'm in hell when I'm discordant, right? Yeah, and of course, in the, in the projection, when we project it out, and it was so interesting in exploring for this talk, we um, actually looked at some of Ernest Holmes' writings and, um, and some of his lectures uh, during the Second World War. Um, and he spoke about, he wrote about, and he spoke about this idea that the very tools that we use to heal our own consciousness are the tools that we come together to use to heal the consciousness um, of what's going on around us. And so much of it was so pertinent um, for today. And so in the process of recognizing that we have a tendency to project our very own discordance or our anger, our blame, our us and them, all of the ways in which we're living, um, then we have, to we have to really pay attention to our words. Right? Our words have both emotional weight on the one hand, right? They, our words carry emotional weight in our relationships, as well as the fact that in the science of mind, we understand that our words are creative. So, so we start with paying attention with what's going on on the inside, what we're taking in, how we're dealing with it, how we're processing it. But then it's also, we have to begin to pay attention to how we're now re representing that um, with our words. We have to, the first of all, learn how to feel our feelings and let them out in healthy ways, right? Projection is not a healthy way to feel our feelings. Um, fear about what might be happening, anger about what might be happening, um, uncertainty about what's the right form or the right answer for our country, right? These kinds of things are things that we have feelings about. But the question is, are we presenting those feelings in a healthy way? Are we allowing them to motivate us to move and to engage or to, or to do our spiritual mind treatment? Or are we simply not paying attention, right? When we don't pay attention with our words, we get into those ain't it awful conversations. Aren't they awful? Aren't they awful? Isn't it awful what's happening? How horrible that is? Over and over and over again. We use dismissive or disparaging words towards those we disagree with. We actually question their sanity or their capability of making a decent decision. On the other hand, the other thing we do with our words is that we simply resign or settle. Well, you know, it's just the way it is. Well, there's nothing you can do about it. So, there you go. I'm just going to go be about my own life. 
right? And do you see that when we start paying attention, we pay attention not only to our thoughts, but we actually have to pay attention to our words. And are our words contributing to the raising of the vibration, the elevation of consciousness? Are our words for the things that we value and the things that we stand for? Or are we just tossing off words that come out of our fear or our anger, our projections, or our own sense of, what is that, discord, helplessness, whatever that might be, to pay attention to the words that we use. Yeah, and to, uh, to in addition to that, to, as we are taking responsibility for our words, to be aware of actually the tone as well of the words that are coming out of our mouths. So the words may be kind, but the tone sure isn't. Mm -hmm. I love you, <laughs> you know? And so these emotionally laden words and um, to, be, to take great care, not only in the what we're saying, it's the how we're also saying it and the energetic behind it and the tonality. You know, um, you can say very kind words and especially the parents in the room know this. You can say something and yet the tone in which the child knows, like, did I just do something wrong? And yet they were kind words that came out of your mouth. So um, take great care in how we're saying it as well. Because then there's also, well, is that what you meant? Mm -hmm. Because you said that, but it sure didn't sound right. like you were agreeing with me or whatever. Right. Yes. Right. Do we mean what we say? And do we say it in a way that really conveys what we mean? Right? This is, and these are the ways in which we create division and we create polarization and we create judgment and we create separation and we foster the separation that we're actually all trying to heal that experience of separation that we're actually tr all trying to heal. And so we remember that the, the, that our, the sum total of our words is creating an atm a mental atmosphere. And that mental atmosphere is inherently creative, right? That's what we were reading that Ernest Holmes was talking about. We know that we do this individually. And so are we contributing to the collective mental atmosphere? How, what are our words adding to that collective mental atmosphere. Are we creating a mold for what we want or are we continuing to create a mold for what we don't want? Are we using, consciously using our words to be for the things that are of value to us, that are important to us? Or are we using our words to blame and shame and, and create tension and divisiveness? I think one of the most challenging things that we do with our words is the use of labels. When we label, oh, somebody has an idea, and if we can just fit it into a label, then we believe that we know everything there is to know about it, and we can sit in judgment of it. Rather than actually being curious or asking questions, making sure that we're not labeling other people, which goes back to that us, oh, us and them. I, I, know, what I know what those words mean. I know what they say, what they're saying when they say those words, right? And we call that, we give that a label. And one of the most divisive things we can do is to not, not so much own our own um, uniqueness, we, right? Sometimes our labels are important to us. It's, it's more important that we pay attention to the labels that we're throwing onto others, right? And the box that that becomes that we hold people in and judge them around. And, and the question comes, can we disagree with ideas and forms that we have different ideas and forms of without discouraging or disparaging the other person? Mm -hmm. can, we, um, can we begin to challenge our own assumptions and disagree in the most loving way possible? Like, it's okay to disagree calling uh, someone to consciousness uh, sometimes is the most loving thing we can do. And um, we can do this without disparaging. 
So it's, it's all of this um, that even if we disagree with the ideas and forms, we can do it without disparaging the other person. And there are times when we can step in in a loving manner and call someone to consciousness. Yeah, and, and to invite, to, and to invite an, a, an opportunity to think about, you know, are these words or these ideas or these forms in alignment with our spiritual truth or with our global vision or with the way that things we value? I mean, we get to have all of those conversations, and at the end of the day, we can agree to disagree. We can. We are actually spiritually maturing beings, are we not? And isn't that what spiritually maturing means? That we can agree to disagree without impugning other people's personhood, recognizing that we are actually all on the path together, wherever we happen to be on the path. And to, and, and to feel our own strength, that we can say what we feel needs to be said, but to do it, as, as Karen was talking about, without attack, without blame, without judgment, but to really say, no, I, I just really don't agree with that. You, you actually get to say that. You get to say, I don't agree with that. That's not how I would answer this, whatever it is. But do you see that's very different than you stupid idiot, how can you possibly think that way? <laughs> do you see, right? Comple it's, a, it's completely different. And, and that's where our responsibility, that's how we contribute to the healing as opposed to the perpetuation of the divisiveness. And then that shows up in the way in which we show up in the world, how we're showing up in the world. You see, when, we have, when we're doing our inner work to really be clear about what's important to us, to be in congruence with what's important to us, and we're doing the work to pay attention to the words and the language that we're letting in and sending back out again, do you see, then we can act in the world from that centered conscious place. We're neither we're retreating, we don't want to offend anybody, we don't want to get into a big argument, we don't really, you know, we already know what the other person's going to say, so why bother, all that stuff, nor do we attack. We can simply stand in that conscious, centered place, this is how it is for me, this is how I see it. We can have a conversation, and we can either agree or disagree from that deeper, centered place. And when we're in that space, you see, we can engage from truth and inner alignment, which are about values and the qualities of God. And we don't have to beat ourselves or each other up around the forms that those things take or what we think may or may not be the right answer. So doing the inner work with our thoughts and feelings and doing the inner work with our, and doing the work with our words does not preclude action. It means that we move our feet from a certainty of the love and light that is the truth of our being and the truth of every being that we are engaged with. And it is unquestionably the final outcome we're all going for. Right? We're all going for a world that works. And that is the impulsion of life itself. The entire trajectory of the universe is going in that direction. And as our thoughts and words and actions align with that, we're, we're simply helping to midwife that in the best way that we know individually how to do that. Yeah, and coming from that grounded place on the inside, then we can continue to come from the causal place in consciousness because we know that consciousness is causal, that our thoughts are causal, and therefore we're less likely to react from conditions that are going on around us. And, the, and we come from that grounded place and we can choose how to be and we can choose what to do from that grounded place, from that centered, truth, trusting place, knowing place that um, we are because we are causal, we are also causal for the entire race consciousness, the human race consciousness as well when we come from that centered place. We're not contributing to the fear. We're not contributing to the anger. And uh, we're not contributing to that from a cultural standpoint, this race consciousness of fear, of anger, and divisiveness. We're also, as Petra said, we're not retreating. And we're not attacking. We're coming from that centered place, and we're engaging from that. Ernest Holmes says, 
when God produced an instrument, humans, through which God could consciously act, this advent of choice and will enabled them to accomplish that which nature had not done specifically. So our power, our energy, and our imagination is God individualized in us. And so we are that instrument. We are that place where nature could not do it. And so how are we playing our instrument? How are we bringing our song, not only in our individual life, but in the collective race consciousness as well? Right. And so this is what we need to be doing ourselves as spiritual beings. This is what we're called to. Right? This is how we contribute to the, um, to the release of, these, of the sense of separation, to the healing of this divisiveness that we have seen and experienced. And we are, we are standing on our deep commitment. We are radically inclusive. And boy, that, that, is a cha that is a huge, if you've really not stopped to think about what radically inclusive means. <laughs> Just, you know, just look around the room and, and find people who are different or have a different idea. And, and we, Karen and I really talk about that this, we're the microcosm. We, we're a microcosm. We're practicing something pretty, I think, pretty outrageous to really be radically inclusive. We talk a lot about in the science of mind, we like to hang around like-minded people. It's, it's really good to make sure that you're supported by like-minded people, no question about it. You don't, want to, you don't want to tell your dreams to somebody and have them shoot it down. But there is something about expanding our ability to see the oneness and to be in relationship with people who are unique, beautiful, precious, precious instruments of the divine. And so this is what we're called to be, not to add, and so not to add to the divisiveness in our own consciousness, right? That's the first thing. We have to be, we have to work on our own congruence. We have to, we have to look at our own inner discord. When are we not living according to our values? Then we have to really pay attention to being a centering influence every time we act or speak about those things that are important to us. This does not mean we don't speak about or act in the way that, uh, about things that are important to us. But it, is, but it is paying attention to how we engage in that. I mean, there's a reason why we call it civil society, because we are actually all in this together. We're part of that infinite spiritual oneness, and we are getting to explore what that looks like when we are in community and when we are um, coming together as a nation and quite frankly now because our planet is so tiny, right, as a world. Yeah, I, I'm reminded that um, when the ministers were here for the CSL ministers gathering, um, the ministers, most of the ministers and many people from this community, we went down to Dallas City Plaza and we had um, healing the consciousness of racism. And Peter and I spent hours upon hours uh, ensuring that when we said, spoke our words, we wrote it down, every word, that when we each stood up there and talked about this healing, the consciousness of racism in America, we made no one wrong. It's very important. And, yep. and there was someone that also spoke and did not write it down, therefore we didn't see it in advance, and spoke extemporaneously. And there was one cameraman, all the media was notified, and one cameraman showed up. And there was a moment when that, uh, that, uh, when that person spoke that he made a station, news station, wrong. And I'm telling you, within 60 seconds after this person had been out there for 40 minutes doing his thing, getting the shots, doing it great, I was watching him, I was admiring the cameraman off to my right. In less than 60 seconds, he was gone. 
And we learned something very valuable why? in that moment. Why was he gone? Because somebody made him wrong. Right? We cannot, we can't heal divisiveness by making the, my, whoever the other side is, whatever it's, whatever's on the other side of whatever the idea is or the form, making them wrong is not going to build a bridge. It's not. It's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so that was a really powerful moment for Karen and I, right? Can we really practice being for things, for our values? For how we understand the science of mind invites us to be in the world, the, the, the um, values that it gives us, the, the, f the things that we see that, um, make, that create a world that works for everyone. Can we work for those things and help heal those things that are standing in the way? Um, and, and so to really pay attention to that, I mean, it's so easy to toss a sentence off on Facebook. Ooh, man, I know you've done it. I've done it. And then I've had to delete the post, <laughs> right? It's like learning how to write that email and then walk away. Do not push send, right? T think about it for 24 hours and then maybe recraft the email because now we've cooled down and we've had an opportunity, right? We've all had to learn how to do this. And with social media and some of the ways in which we can engage with each other, it's so easy to just toss off that unthinking comment which is the very thing that happens in our personal relationships, isn't it? That unthinking comment, that unthinking word, that unthinking action. And, and so our job is always to remember how are we showing up in the world? Ernest Holmes says, if we could just identify ourselves with life and forget death, with love and forget hate, with joy and forget misery, with peace and forget discord, with abundance and forget limitation, how wonderful it would be. There has to come an awakening. Every one of us in the simple integrity of our own individual soul must learn to meet the universe in exaltation. <clears throat> to meet the universe in exaltation. To speak into being that which you believe is important that which you hold dear to your hearts, that which you value and see as the ground of your being. So we really talked about that, you know, it, it's, there's been some challenges for our community and for people in families and loved ones and workplaces. Um, and we have, and since the last election, especially around the last election, this coming election is only two days away. And we thought maybe it would be, it would be good to prepare ourselves to keep reminding ourselves who we want to be, how we want to show up, how we want to engage. And we really, really, really want to encourage you to engage. Sitting out is not engaging. Not voting is a choice. We think we're not choosing, but choosing not to choose, we've all learned in foundations class, right? Choosing not to choose is as much of a choice. So we encourage you, we, act, we ask you to, to take responsibility for the sacred act of voting. It is a responsible action in, in engaging from our values and our beliefs um, as they resonate and as they are framed in your heart and your mind. Our spirituality should never, we should never use our spirituality for resignation. We should never use our spirituality for divisiveness, and we should never use it as an excuse not to fly, not to shine, as Doreen so beautifully sung to us. We're all here to fly. We're all here to shine. But we do not fly or shine alone. We do it together. So as we move into prayer, I... Um I move to, this is a microcosm, an experiment, and we are radically inclusive. I would love for um, you to look around this place right here and look at each other, look in the eyes of one another. We support one another in this community. We don't all uh, think alike. We don't all want the same form in its specifics. And yet, like Petrus said, 
we are all working towards a world that works for everyone. A world, a, a nation that works for everyone. A state that works for everyone. A city that works for everyone. A workplace, a neighborhood, a family. I mean, the micro can get pretty micro. A life that works for me. Mm -hmm. A world that works for everyone and a life that works for me. So we can be, and we are, that grounded place. If we took this up, that no matter what, we are that grounded place. We are that microcosm that says we are standing together as a community. We are standing for love. We are standing for peace. We're standing for equity. We're standing for justice. Whatever it is in our global vision that you truly want to stand for. Can you feel it in the room? So I invite us to stand inside ourselves and to remember who we are to ourselves and to the one life, the one power, the one presence. It's that which unabashedly gives to itself so fully and so freely and it gives in the form of love and peace. It has this wholeness about it, which means there's absolutely no thing lacking. There is no limitation to it. So what I'd like for you to do now to close this prayer, I'd like you to stand up. And I want you to reach your hands out to the people around you. Find your place of connection. And as you have your eyes open or closed, just feel Feel the hands that you hold. That is the presence of the divine. No matter what that person looks like, where they come from, what they believe, what they think, we are one. And as we have created this human chain, let us recognize that this human chain is the metaphor, the epitome of that oneness made manifest right here in this room. We claim that oneness as the healing power in consciousness. We claim ourselves as being of beings of love and light, that we are that place in consciousness. That we stand utterly convinced that when we stand in this wholeness, when we know the truth of who we are, we know the truth of who each and every person is. And we grab each other's hands all around the Metroplex, all around the U.S., all around the world, for we are one. And if you, like me, agree with this statement, let us seal it with our love and faith, our trust and truth, by saying together, and so it is.